21st Century Surgery, next on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Modern healthcare involves many sciences, the chemistry of pharmacy that provides drugs that help battle disease, the biology of maintaining a healthy body with exercise, nutritional science showing us the way of a healthy diet. Surgery might be called the procedural side of healthcare, the actual process of draining an abscess, cutting something bad out. It may be setting a bone or opening and or bypassing an artery that doesn't flow as it should. Tonight, we visit the surgical suite. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. The best treatment for an infection that has collected into a red, hot, swollen, painful, inflamed boil is, number one, antibiotics and cold compresses. Number two, a knife into the pocket of pus and hot compresses. Three, massage and crystal therapy. Call or email your answer now, and we'll take quiz answers for only 10 minutes. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing or win a signed copy of A Picture of Health. This book was written by me and accompanying photographs by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in, and we answer your questions. We want your questions as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email or call in your questions to one 376 6225 or send us an email. Joining us tonight is Jeff Johnson of the Avera Medical Group Brookings and Gary Timmerman, the head of surgical residency program at USD Stanford School of Medicine. Welcome both of you to the show. Thank you. Thank Jeff, you tell us a little bit about where you're from and your training and your experience and a little sure. bit about you. Sure. Uh, well, I grew up in uh, out west in Colorado. And so you're a Colorado boy. Yes, yes. I uh, went to college initially in North Dakota, which is where I met my wife and gained my ties to the area. Her family now lives in Sioux Falls. You were going to be a, a, an airplane pilot. Yeah, I, I was going to plan on being a professional airline pilot, yes, and I... I still fly rarely um, but uh, decided to uh, you know change my mind went back to the University of Colorado and uh, eventually uh, attended medical school for a brief period of time in the Caribbean and then I uh, spent most of my training in Kansas City where I did a second half of medical school and stayed for surgical training and I practiced in Colorado briefly and then came up here and we're so glad to have you in Brookings yeah, South Dakota I'm thrilled to be here and it's great to have Everything he touches seems to turn gold, as we like to say. <laughs> so, uh, Gary, you're uh, you're from originally from Watertown. Watertown, born and raised in Watertown. I'm a South Dakota product. Um, Where did you go to undergrad? Undergrad at SDSU, and then uh, medical school for a couple of years at uh, University of South Dakota, and then Washington University in St. Louis. I did my surgical training at Rush in Chicago, always with the intent, absolutely with the intent, to come back to my home state and went back to Watertown and uh, gave back to the community that gave me so much and practiced there for 10 years and then moved to Sioux Falls about 18, 20 years ago and I've been in Sioux Falls since. Were you at the Bartron Clinic or the Brown Clinic? The original Bartron Clinic, but you know, uh, in those days, and I still think today, both clinics worked very well together. It really didn't matter um, the, the um, quote unquote side you were on, surgeons always help out surgeons. And so um, actually was helped recruited by uh, very good friends from the Brown Clinic as well when I went back to Watertown. Yeah, and you know, I have to say that Bob Bartron, God bless his soul, uh, took him, me under his wing and tried to keep me in, in Watertown. I did my uh, MECO summer times uh, when I was in med school. In the, in, in the Bartron Clinic. He was very instrumental to the state of South Dakota to help us get the four-year med school. He, yes, he and was. he was uh, in the legislature in South Dakota back in those years and was actually there at the signing when they uh, made it an official four-year school. Yeah, and I think some of my closest friends are in the Brown Clinic right now yep. up there, so yep. it's a good and place. And me as well. But you moved to Sioux Falls because? Well, um, at the time, 
Uh, I have some advanced training in trauma and advanced training in, in uh, surgical oncology. And you wanted to get into and that. And I wanted right? to get into that a little yeah. bit more. And so an opportunity arose that they needed somebody to help with trauma. And so I was the trauma director at then Sioux Valley and now Sanford, and then um, did that for 10 years, and then uh, broadened my surgical oncology practice, and then also got involved with the medical school. And that's how you became the head of the Department of Surgery yeah, and the uh, residency program. Yes, that's correct. And uh, about three years ago, um, was able to get into the position of being the chair of the department, and uh, um, almost uh, for uh, the last six or seven years, uh, noted that there was such a deficiency in and replacing our rural surgeons across the state, um, and also coming from the land of Chet McVeigh. Yes. Um, in Yankton, South Dakota. Dr. McVeigh uh, and, and We McVay. have not had a residency here in surgery since 1986. And so um, the timing was ripe. Um, uh, I will give credit to Sanford. They actually came up with the money for us to do it, as well as all the support and all the faculty that we could do. Uh, also had great assistance with our colleagues down in Yankton, and so a part of our residency is back to the homeland of Chet McVeigh in right. Yankton, and that's Avera as well, and then also the VA in South Dakota. Yeah. So, very great. delighted. Great. And I have to say that I was sitting in uh, at Emory in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, on the surgical rotation as a junior medical student, and they were giving a lecture on how to do the hernia repair, and they said, well, and there was this guy named Chet McVeigh, who is an anatomist, and then he went into surgery, and then, he developed the hernia repair that we all use, and then he moved to South Dakota, for goodness sake. And I said, that's where I'm from. Yep. And the whole group kind of kind Absolutely. Of I, I was uh, at St. Louis in the exact same scenario uh, where I had to give a talk on a, a hernia repair and talked about the McVeigh repair. Yeah. And one of the residents disagreed, and I said, no, it's done this way. And the chairman in the back of the room said, Dr. Timmerman, why don't you tell them where you're from? And yeah. I said, well, I'm from South Dakota. <laughs> and the chair said, uh, Dr. Timmerman is correct. Now, I wasn't in the greatest graces with that chief resident anymore, <laughs> but I did have very good training from Chet McVeigh. Yes, you did. Uh, please remember that this is, uh, your calls are what matters to us. And so we want you to give us a call at, and I, the 1-800 number, and, uh, or give us an internet uh, message, and give us your questions. It's your questions that make this show. So, uh, had, and you heard of the McVeigh repair. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, oh. It's, it's a specific type of hernia repair where the patient's tissues are all used to repair what's a defect in the muscular layer. Nowadays, we really use a piece of mesh or a prosthetic material, kind of a screen, to provide what's called a tension-free repair. And McVeigh actually had that in mind because his repair does release tension Relaxing. by making an incision in one of the layers. Right, and that's his key deal, wasn't it? It was that, that you Relaxing. got the relaxation. Yes. So let's talk about the history of surgery. Uh, when did the surgeons, you know, we all talk about surgery as a different field than medicine. You know, I'm an internist. And there's all the internal medicine-oriented fields, cardiology, nephrology, rheumatology, you know, and so on and so forth. The surgical fields are different, but how did it all start? Well, I mean, it, there's a strong history in surgery being um, a barber surgeon. So the, uh, the barbers were the ones, as I think Dr. Timmerman mentioned earlier when we were discussing this, that they had the sharpest knives. So they had uh, the access to some of the tools that were necessary. And they also were intimately involved in a barber touches a person and a patient, and that was something that the uh, internists didn't historical, want to do. <laughs> historical physicians were reluctant to participate in. Right, so the surgeons versus the physicians is kind of how it went. And the barber pole, what's that story? Go ahead. Oh, well, the, I mean, obviously you can't, just like you can't make an omelet without breaking an egg, you can't perform surgery without some bleeding, and the barber would use his rags to mop up the blood, and then would wring them out and place them out on the pole outside of his office. So the classic twirling red, red pole is red, the, blood. the barber pole, yes. So when did this surgical story all begin? Well, actually, there's been record of surgeons dating back to Hippocrates and also um, even to Galen in Rome. Uh, Galen was actually a, a Greek who lived in Rome and was one of the physicians, if you will, to the gladiators. And same sort of thing, a lot of taboo. You weren't allowed to touch the body unless the body was uh, dead. And even then, you could do something that would upset the gods. They really didn't want it. So much of medicine there was 
observation and then you would take that observation and you could operate on animals and so you came up with different ideas about process and disease and and I think one of the most interesting things about uh, Galen uh, and Hippocrates were um, back in the day if you will they tried to describe things again as we had mentioned by observation and uh, I, there was a, a I'm told and I wasn't there there was a, a gal who apparently had a breast cancer and she had died from a horrible breast cancer because of course it wasn't removed and the cancer took over her chest and in their description uh, they looked at that and, and I think it was Hippocrates actually looked at it and says that looks like a crab and as you might recall the astrological name of the crab is cancer, cancer. and so basically uh, the term cancer if you will actually was coined by people describing that back in the day of um, you know around 129 or 130 AD so it was a long time ago that uh, people were making mostly observation, practicing on other things, and it really wasn't until the Civil War where they had to go into action, and, and there were still barbers doing that. There were very few really trained surgeons to do the only operation of the day, which was amputation. Yeah, and it did save lives. It saved thousands and thousands of lives. Right. Because they didn't realize sterility. Now, I, d I do know that they knew anesthesia. Do you know the story of anesthesia, either one of you guys? Yeah, it was uh, developed by a dentist, I believe, at, uh, in Boston. Well, actually, it was a guy from Georgia, rural Georgia, before him, and there was a big debate, but the d dentist got the credit. Oh, oh really? Okay. The, you know, the ether, right. ether dome yes. in Boston, but it was Crawford Long in oh. Georgia who had done, seven years earlier, had, had used uh, uh, ether right. to, take, to, to drain a boil. Well, prior to anesthesia, the most important, one of the, the most important factors of any surgical procedure was speed because the patient was being subjected to horrific amounts of pain, pain. And, and oftentimes they may have been better off after the surgery from whatever surgical disease ailed them, but there was such a trauma that they recalled from having this happen that they were scarred for life, if you will, in, more, way, in more ways than one. Yeah. And, <laughs> So with anesthesia, it took, the, it took that out of the equation. It also made everyone else a little bit more relaxed because the surgeon didn't have to worry about speed yeah. and the pain. You didn't have to and hold the patient Very down. much so up until then, I'm sorry, but it was a shot of whiskey and a bullet that you would chew on. And, yeah. and again, these amputations, most of them, unfortunately, even by the Confederate side, didn't have the anesthesia. They did have ether, but they, didn't, they ran out of it. And so speed, again, was it. Uh, speed for purposes of pain and speed for purposes of blood loss. And, and they could literally do an amputation under a minute. Yeah, and they, have it taken care of with under a minute. Yeah. And it was remarkable what they were able to do, but it was the circumstance, not necessarily the best. Right. Uh, the, now, sterility came in after the Civil War. Yes. What's that story? Well, I'm pretty much Lister and his, his identification of, of bacteria that was involved in things such as, again, a, a badge of honor to a surgeon was how bloody his drape was. And a badge of honor how good a surgeon was, the more blood on his apron, the better he was because he had more experience. Not recognizing that all of that carried with it the bacteria and everything that went along with it. And so it, um, and then when folks actually realized that, they began to do some surgery with, I don't remember what the, what the antiseptic they sprayed in the room as they did the surgery, but they actually saw wound infections go down for the first time. Uh, I've actually heard that's where the white coat was came from because once people realized that dirt meant a lack of sterility, doctors formerly wore and surgeons wore black or dark colored clothing. And once they realized that, boy, it kind of makes a difference how dirty one of these guys looks, let's put a white coat on them and see how dirty yeah. they look because that probably means they, they're, they're more they need to wash up. So uh, we have got questions, and I'm going to borrow this one because this one isn't working. Sure. A woman from Rapid City with degenerative back disease, is it better to have surgery or hope the pain resides than to avoid surgery and no. keep making, taking pain medicines? Back surgery, that's a tough question. That's a good question. Um, answer. Well, uh, there's no answer uh, that is straightforward. Um, it's a, one of the 50-50 things. Um, uh, I myself have had some back injuries and I know exactly uh, her predicament and the discomfort. Um, I was told by very intelligent neurosurgeons that with even a herniated disc, 
Um, there's about a 50% chance that'll get better with physical therapy in time if you can put up with it, provided you're not losing um, uh, muscle activity or actual strength. And that um, once you do surgery, um, it's, um, that's it. Uh, you really, it's harder to fix it the next time and the next time and the next time. So I, I certainly understand the difficulty that this patient is suffering. And um, the most neurosurgeons would tell you to try absolutely everything before. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I the, the, the generally pain is not the reason for surgery. It's loss of neural function, function. that Correct. brings you to it. Uh, a but, wise surgeon once told me that if you operate for pain, that's exactly what you get. You're going to have more pain. Yeah. <laughs> you do not want to the operate. The only one that has pain is the surgeon. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of pain and yeah. suffering afterwards. Um, we've got some uh, pictures uh, that I want to start with. Uh, this is a picture of an operating room. Any comments about what do you notice about this, Jeff? Well, the first thing that kind of is striking to folks who have never been in an operating room is probably what are all those people doing in there? Um, this individual here. Oh, it's, oh, touch the red button. Yeah, there we go. This individual here and here. They are the surgical nurses. They are responsible for kind of taking care of the patient, taking care of a lot of the logistical issues that come into the operating room. Uh, and you'll notice that they are not, you may, they not. do not have uh, these blue gowns on. So they are not scrubbed. So they can leave the operating room to go get different instruments, different materials, et cetera. Uh, this person right here, this is uh, the anesthetist or the individual that's going to be administering the anesthetic. And you'll notice right here, this that screen uh, contains all of the vital information that is obviously the most prominent uh, piece of equipment in his view. This machine is the what administers the anesthetic here. And then these two individuals here are the surgical technicians. They're trained in... Uh, mark them a little harder. Oh, there we go. This one and this one. They're the surgical technicians. They're trained in understanding all of the different instruments available to the surgeons. They're trained in some of the anatomy and they assist the surgeon in uh, in the operation. So that's a, a busy room and then of course this is the patient. Yes, yes, that's the, that, the patient we is... We know which one is the patient. Right there. So I'm that's good. Down. good <laughs> one that's lying down. Uh, we, we now know that it was Susan Cambo who correctly answered our question. Thank you Susan for your answer. The book will be in the mail uh, shortly. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be uh, Talking about that later. So let's let's uh, let's talk now about the uh, advance this uh, history thing, and and let's talk about aseptic neck technique. A lot of the things that you show here is uh, sterility. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and of course, right here in this town, we have 3M Medical, which makes a lot of sterile things. To explain some of the things that the the 3M makes, uh, and I'm not trying to promote 3M or anything, but they make these gowns and this tape and what, what's that all about, Gary? Well, um, many of the products that we use uh, throughout the nation come from actually this plant here in South Dakota. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, they make types of tape that are adhesive but don't take your hide off when we pull it off. They make, uh, uh, as you mentioned, these uh, yellow iobands, they're called. Um, that are uh, clear tape that are impregnated with uh, an iodine that again will help reduce infection. Um, they, so I mean they, they plaster it on plaster the skin it right and then you the cut, through cut it. right through it. It's sort of like a giant piece of saran wrap with uh, an adhesive side that goes over the patients that, where the operating field is. Yeah, it's yep. amazing. Um, they'll, um, they help us with a lot of their dressings that we use to um, put and do dressing changes. Uh, all of this of course made absolutely sterile and absolutely reliable, and that's why they have such a great name in this uh, in this area, and certainly throughout the United States. Wow. One of my favorite products is something called a Steri Strip, which is a small adhesive tape of variable sizes that I always enjoy putting over a surgical wound because it just gives me a, a, a sense of satisfaction. And whenever I take anybody's staples out or remove their stitches, I always put Steri -strip. a little Steri Strip on there, and I said these are made right here in Brookings. Well, <laughs> and not only that, as far as his comment about it, it makes him feel more secure. It makes the patients feel secure. Right. Uh, a lot of the surgeries that we do, we put stitches under the skin. They don't see it. And it's strong enough to hold, but these little steri strips actually 
bring the edges a little bit closer, but it actually also gives a little bit of, uh, how would I call security of the patient that it's not gonna open. I always joke with my thyroid patients that um, after surgery, there'll be no stitches, it's all underneath, and you'll have little pieces of steri strips across your neck. And I tell them they can turn left, they can turn right, but don't look back, because if those tapes weren't there, their head would fall off. It oh. never, of course, <laughs> never does. But, I, and, and it, but it always gets a smile on their face, and, and it really, you know, if anything, they then also see where it is, and they know um, exactly what's been done. And right. the nice part is those fall off typically within a week or so, right. and um, it really, um, I think add additional comfort to the patient when they go home that that's not going to fall apart. I will also say that the Littman stethoscope is put together right here in this plant. Yeah. The Littman cardiology scope, which which uh, many of us use. I don't know if you oh. you've listened to we use a Littman cardiology <laughs> scope, but uh, that's my been equipment. A, been a year or two since I <laughs> no. We use stethoscopes. I don't know about the cardiology oh, stethoscope. Okay. Someone yeah. asked me once, I was carrying a stethoscope, and it was an internal medicine uh, physician, and they said, do you have privileges to use that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let's talk about the differences between surgery and uh, internal medicine. I would say that internal medicine, the physicians of old, the American College of Physicians, my club, um, we, uh, you do uh, residency in internal medicine. Some of us go out and practice. Some uh, people uh, teach for a while, uh, and then uh, some people would go into rheumatology, cardiology, nephrology, all of the subspecialties of internal medicine, uh, geriatrics, which is a subspecialty of internal medicine and family practice. Um, but what are the specialties of surgery? Well, I can tell you that um, there are, I came up with some 20 different types of specialties in surgery today, um, of which um, general surgery, what we're both general surgeons is the is the precursor for most of those. And um, out of those 20, well over half of them uh, will require that you do five years of general surgical training first before you're allowed to do that particular specialty. Thoracic you know, surgery. Thoracic surgery, vascular surgery, pediatric surgery, colorectal surgery. All of those uh, do have a prerequisite to do five years of general surgery first. Uh, there are some disciplines, urology, um, neurosurgery, ENT, ear, nose, and throat, uh, in which you would do probably two years of general surgery and then complete your residency in those specialties. Oh. But uh, yeah. really, and, and now the, the new thing is, and again, because of the change in the way we're training residents, uh, more and more are choosing these specialties and general surgeons are becoming fewer and fewer. I had mentioned to some students earlier, uh, the United States produces about 1,000 general surgeons a year. Uh, only 200 or less go into general surgery for the entire nation. And right now- and We have one, in, yes. we have two in Brookings. Yes, you're very fortunate. Oh, and, and, and I need to tell you that um, those 200 have to be spread across the entire United States to fill over 1,000 to 1,500 retiring every year. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the math doesn't equal. Uh, I'm just trying to think about whether we should talk about uh, anything else in this video here. Jeff, you picked this uh, picture because? Sure. Uh, a little bit later on, we, we're going to be watching uh, some video of a, a surgical procedure where you may hear the term, uh, the count is correct. And if you notice, look at all these things. I mean, there's, there's probably 40, 50 instruments right there. And every time someone goes through an operation, those instruments are counted before and after to ensure that nothing is left Lots behind. Of, right. Not only the instruments, but uh, you can't quite see them. They're right here. These are the sponges that we use in an operation. Those are also counted. Those are actually counted twice. Uh, every needle. And every needle, yes, and every blade. Uh, so yeah. I, I mean, That's I, why you've got those nurses that, that, that count all those parts. That's, no, that's correct, but I mean, you d just, uh, I'm, when I'm closing a wound, that's one of the things I enjoy hearing most is... Sponge the, count is the, correct. The count is correct. Lap and instrument count is correct. Yes. Yes, and I want you to know, I go into that same operating room and, and, and uh, do colonoscopies, and I get done and they say, colonoscope is correct count. <laughs> well, and, and, and I, need to, I need to also share that it isn't just that at the end of the case, that we now have taken such precautions to prevent error, that we have what's called surgical timeouts. 
Uh, I find it interesting. I did not know Jeff was a pilot, and pilots and surgeons are very much put in the same group where we yeah. have our checklists before yeah. we do things. In surgery, one of them is a preoperative checklist, and we will, uh, with everyone in the room, call a timeout and make sure everybody knows not only who we're operating on, but what part of the body we're operating on and which limb, left or right all of it in an attempt to improve outcomes and improve patient safety. And there's plenty of data that suggests that the, the timeout does have some impact uh, okay. on improving outcome. Yep. So there, these are just like uh, counting the, the wheels on the airplane before it takes off or whatever they, whatever they do on the airplane. He would know better than me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. People sometimes avoid going in for a routine checkup with their physician for fear something serious like cancer will be discovered. The truth is, though, that the early detection of a problem has the best chance of a positive outcome. This is a huge surprise to me to have thyroid cancer. I, I went in for just a... Just oh, kind of a generic, like a well woman. yeah, well woman. That's exactly yeah. right. Excellent. And I went, what? Okay. I've noticed, you know, just because I'm more cognizant of it now. I never. I went, well, it doesn't look like anything. And and now I, when I look in the mirror, I can see that there is a little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, it's harder to swallow. Okay. I do have changes in your voice. Horse. Okay. A little. I have to clear my throat voice more often than I than I uh, ever have before. Okay. And there's pressure in my, it's not an earache, but it's it's like it's a, different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought it was related because I've always had allergies, so I thought it was related to my allergies. I thought, you know. But. We make an incision on the neck, a couple of finger breasts above the collarbone here. And then um, there's a few different muscle layers that we need to open up in that area. And then um, we start on the left side because even though it's in the middle portion, it's kind of off to the left okay. on that side. And so we'll take the left side up, um, go around the vessels at the top, find the vessels in the middle as well as on the bottom part. Mm -hmm. Be sure that we can find the parathyroid glands, which are the glands on the back side that regulate your calcium level. We need to make sure that those are left inside because otherwise she's going to have problems with calcium regulation. Okay. Then we'll move over to the right side and do the same thing over there. Afterwards, basically what we do is we make sure that everything is nice and dry. There's no evidence of bleeding, nothing concerning there, that mm -hmm. her parathyroid glands are good. Mm -hmm. And then we close up your muscle layers. Okay. Then after that, we put sutures in the skin. Mm -hmm. um, everything will be on the inside, and then there'll be some glue over the outside. Oh, just glue on the yep, outside? just glue on the really? outside. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh. Now it's considered to be a one-day procedure. It's not considered to be an inpatient procedure. However, we do you later so that we can keep you overnight, overnight for observation. watching you. Okay. Um, because there is a risk uh, associated bleeding. with um, thyroid surgery, yeah, with bleeding. And if there is bleeding in terms of a hematoma or a big blood clot, that can close off your airway sure. and, um, and kill you. And right. so we want right. to be sure that we're able to catch that very, very quickly. And I know you've told me before, but in my anxiety, I had forgotten the, the prognosis of this is good then? Yes, the prognosis of papillary cancer is very good. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I want to be around a while more. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>
typically these saddlebags then when you think of a horse doesn't lay on the front or I'm sorry the back of the horse it lays on the side of the horse and regrettably some of these nodules if you will that can be abnormal can get fairly large before we can actually feel them from the front because they're hiding posteriorly they're going toward the back they're behind behind um, and once we see it or feel a nodule it doesn't automatically mean cancer I um, all of us, uh, Jeff will tell you this too, Jeff will tell you this too, that um, in a diagnosis of cancer, I tell again my patients, uh, if the Lord told me, Timmerman, I've got good news and bad news, the bad news is you're going to have to have cancer in your lifetime, but the good news is I'll let you pick it, I would pick thyroid cancer every time because even, uh, even today, even most of the metastatic thyroid cancers are curable and without losing your hair and without right. horrible radiation treatment. So basically, uh, if in fact this turned out to be a cancer, and the most common is what we call papillary, uh, again in the world of surgery we say be happy if it's pappy, and, and that <laughs> means that it has a wonderful cure rate. It does have a cure rate of over 90 percent, even probably 95 percent, pretty much irrespective of the size. So in a surgery that would involve a nodule that we would be suspicious of cancer, um, we would typically, if we knew at the time of surgery or preoperatively, confirmatively, that that was a cancer, we would tell the individual you'd probably do best to have, at the time of surgery, your entire gland removed. Whereas, uh, if you're not sure, we would take out a portion of the gland and probably remove this part of the gland and send that down to uh, pathology. Thanks. And then pathology may not give us that diagnosis. They may cut that in half and say, we can't tell for sure if it's cancer. And yet, when those patients go home, I always tell them, and I'm sure Jeff does too, there's a chance that when the final word comes back, it's cancer. And then it's how much. And if it's a small amount of cancer, usually less than even two centimeters or one centimeter in size, we may say we're done with surgery. Yep. Whereas if they say this is all cancer and we're worried about it, then we would go back and take the other side. Okay. Whereas again, if it was the first time and they told me it was cancer, I'd probably take both sides. Okay, so now I'm going to take this question. Uh, behind the thyroid are four are little glands. These little parathyroid glands. So yeah. you remove the whole gland and gland. you have to leave the parathyroid. So how do, you, how do you do that? I mean, So again, it's the same story that. of um, para. I tell people and I'm not 100% sure, but I think it has to do with paras, I tell them, means next to. So I tell them the parathyroids are the next to thyroid glands. And at the bottom of the saddlebag, toward the horse's tummy, that's where the sad, these little parathyroids live, two on each side. And quite frankly, um, all you need, and again, I jokingly tell patients, but confidently tell patients, uh, the Lord knew we were gonna do thyroid surgery, so he gave us four parathyroids so that the surgeon Can wouldn't be terrified about it because these <laughs> parathyroids are about the size of the end of your pen. And in a neck, uh, the end of your pen is a, like a ballpoint pen. The size of that in your neck is kind of a needle in a haystack. And so if you are comfortable finding those, they usually hide in a certain spot. But parathyroids are notorious for moving all over. They can move high or they can move low or they can even sit on top of the heart, and I've taken several off of the heart. So they are, really? they are, they are themselves an interesting part of the whole dissection, and you're right, we have to leave at least one of those behind. But do you have to leave them there? I mean, my cousin who had thyroid, yeah. uh, parathyroid surgery had his... In his forearm. In his forearm. Correct, so um, I also, again, will tell them, if you have a condition in which, thankfully, 85% of patients with parathyroid disease, not thyroid, parathyroid disease have a solitary or one gland that's big. And so if you take that out, it takes care of their problem. Right. The other 15% for purposes of simplicity here have anywhere from two to all four involved, of which case then you'd like to take all four of those out, but you can't leave somebody without a parathyroid. Or your so, calcium goes all correct. out. Correct, so we take one gland and we cut it up and I tell them we're planting corn and we're planting it in their forearm and now, if it grows and is a problem, I can do that operation on their forearm, even under local anesthesia, and I never have to go back to the neck again. You know, Dr. Wow. Timmerman makes a good point about uh, <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord knew we were going to do thyroid surgery, yeah. parathyroid surgery, and gave <laughs> yeah. us four. 
uh, for parathyroid glands. I heard a cardiac surgeon mention that the Lord knew we were going to do bypass surgery, which is why he gave us a specific artery in our chest. The internal mammary. Component. Yes, to use it. <laughs> there, there, there are many examples of, of, of why the Lord did these yeah. things. That's <laughs> absolutely amazing. Well, you know what? We've got uh, some pictures, uh, some, a story of, of, um, of gallbladder surgery yep. done with uh, the robot. Yes, the and I'd like robot. to. I'd like to go to that, uh, Jeff. You, you uh, looked at some of these pictures. They're the first picture, tell us um, uh, what this is all about. So this is the initial uh, portion of the operation. The patient is asleep, and uh, we're placing uh, the sterile drapes on top of the patient and exposing what we call the surgical field, the small portion of the body that we will be operating on, or it will contain our incisions. So, and you could see he was putting a sterile yes. handle so he can direct the light without right. losing sterility. Right, yes. All right. So there's one, the, what's the next picture? Uh, okay, so they're positioning the table and then they've moved uh, the robot, the surgical patient cart, into position. Those, those arms are what will uh, control the instruments that are actually placed inside the patient. Here, uh, Dr. Wee, my partner, is positioning the instruments. They're actually inside the patient now and she's watching on the screen. There's a camera that's inside the body that she's using to position or watch the position of the instruments. Wow. And now she will take her surgical gown off and proceed to the uh, to what we call the surgeon cart, which is where we manipulate the robot. So that screen right there is actually uh, a view of what's going on inside. That, that screen is is what the members of the operating team see. What the surgeon sees when they're uh, manipulating the robot is actually a three-dimensional image within uh, the surgeon cart. So the gallbladder's been dissected and what she's doing here is she's placing clips on the small duct that connects the gallbladder to the, to the main bile duct. And she's divided that structure now and she's uh, removing the gallbladder actually off of the liver. And what she's using is, is, a, is an electrical current developed by a guy named Bovi. Um, it is not cautery, it's actually an electrical current that passes from the instrument through the tissue through a grounding pad on the patient. Um, and that's, that's the way the uh, gallbladder is removed wow. off the liver. Because you, you couldn't just cut the gallbladder off the liver because it would, it would bleed. That instrument seals the tissue at the same time. And she's in a cart completely uh, separated from the patient. Separated. Yeah. And she moves and, and you can, it, triples the, the... Yes, what, what she does is she's l looking into a, um, almost like a hood, and there's a screen for each eye, and on the tip of the camera, there's two cameras. So that instills wow. three-dimensional. It, yeah. it adds depth and gives you a, a depth perception. I can tell you in, um, I think the year was 2001, uh, it was uh, called Zeus before it was called Da Vinci. Oh. And the original Zeus was rolled out at a College of Surgeons meeting, and they had the surgeon uh, at a at that booth in San Francisco, and the par and the patient in Paris, France. <laughs> wow! And he did the operation on the patient in Paris, France, in San Francisco, just to show that you didn't have to be, be there. there. And we're going to talk about that. We got one more film. Let's look at the the gallbladder being rem removed. Right. It, so the operation com is complete, uh, almost. Uh, the gallbladder's been removed off the liver. They're moving the robot out of the way, the, the patient portion of the robot. Dr. Wee is uh, re-scrubbed, and they hand her this instrument that extends a small plastic bag. She's inserting it into the abdominal cavity. Uh, there's layers of the abdominal wall, each with a small hole in it. That's why it takes a little bit of finagling to get it in, because there's a defect in the skin, defect in the muscle, and you have to find both of those defects. Now she's got it in, and she's gonna advance it and then open up the instrument, which extends the plastic bag. That other instrument that's in her left hand is manipulating the gallbladder. It's still on the gallbladder. She places it into the bag, which is what she's doing right now. And then she will uh, tighten up, cinch up the plastic bag, and pull it out. And it, it's really to protect the skin from the potentially diseased organ that Infected you're removing. Infected gallbladder that you, you Correct. Yeah. So you're telling me that the guy in San Francisco removed a, a gallbladder on a patient in Paris. Those are great ideas 
a surgeon in Sioux Falls could do surgery in Brookings uh, without a surgeon present, well, probably with a surgeon the, present. I understand but, most of this came from military and trying to figure out ways to get to the wounded people on the battlefield without sacrificing your one surgeon that could serve 20 to 50 wounded people. And so they came up with these sorts of things to think outside the box. And how could you have your surgeon someplace that could be doing something on many people? And they took it one step farther than we would ever do on a military battlefield, at least at this time. But uh, as we speak, there are uh, companies coming up with that very same kind of technology, but in a much smaller fashion that might be able to reach into an abdomen on a battlefield, put in by a med tech with a surgeon off in another place, and do some things to control bleeding to get that patient, internal bleeding, to get that patient to a MASH hospital. Right. You think it, this is something that will happen in South Dakota, rural health, person having yeah, an acute illness. Question. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not, I mean. Thought of that. It's, it brings up an interesting point about the, the robot draws on what's called a laparoscopic or a technique where you use a camera to watch small instruments inside the body. Yeah. But the surgeon manipulating these instruments still has to know what to do and what's going on in the inside because occasionally we need to Open sacrifice up the better visualization, the, the more precise instrumentation to still touch and feel the things that we're doing. Right. And uh, you, you, you'll, a surgeon will always have to be in the yeah. room. Right, do you, do, does the data say that the Da Vinci saves lives, reduces? Uh, it's, just a, it's just a tool. A tool. It's a tool that really builds on some very, fascinating technology with visualization and instrumentation. So it, it has its place particularly now in places what we call very tight space where it might be hard to get in even with standard laparoscopic and certainly very difficult for our hands to so, get in there. So I mean if you do a movement like this uh, outside it may be doing a tiny little movement. Absolutely there, plus reduce. it takes away your shake. Yeah. So it a does. lot of us have an attention tremor and it's gone when you use this. So you could be shaking here and your hand looks steady as a rock inside the camera. Wow. But the shake really doesn't separate a good surgeon from it. I mean, you know, this. No. That hey, Rick, I want to point something out. Yeah. In yours and my lifetime, yes. we went from open operations, everything was open. And I can tell you by the year I finished, which was 89 or so, I went to take my boards and I went to San Francisco. And I met a gentleman who said, are you going to take gallbladders out with the laparoscope? And I said, what's that? And I realized then I was already not trained. And so in that, my lifetime, we have seen surgery so changed by not just uh, what we can do with our hands, but what we can use with technology. And now to where we're doing Da Vinci things and we're talking about all these other things. You wonder why people like surgery, us surgeons? Yeah. It's something new every day when well, I come to work. I have to say it's the same way with internal medicine. I mean, it is in a evolution right now. And we were talking to students earlier before the show. It was great to hear you say that a really good surgeon, I've said this many times, is an internist first and knows the, the head and neck and the heart and the, 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 all of that internal medicine stuff as well, and then you know when to go to surgery or not. Well, it's a, it's a rare opportunity and relationship between a patient and a surgeon because we're having such a profound effect on their physiology by doing the things that we do, making incisions, dissecting tissue. I mean, it is incumbent upon us to understand intimately those details because we're affecting them yeah. profoundly. More importantly, and exactly what he said, is the reverence we as surgeons have that patients allow us to do this. And it is, it's remarkable because um, it's, in my eyes, uh, one thing to do something to them from the outside, but when you let somebody do something to you on the inside and put literally for those moments, uh, your life in the surgeons in God's hands at that moment, that's a trust that we and just never ever get you over. You, you can't, can't get over it. it. You can't betray it either. Correct. I tell patients a lot that I want you to have a wonderful, perfect outcome, just slightly less than you do. Yeah. And you want a perfect outcome. <laughs> I am on your side. Absolutely. We have questions. Woman from Sioux Falls, my husband, 
had surgery for a fractured hip, and after surgery he became incontinent. Is this a common problem, and why does it happen? So, incontinent after hip surgery. There are, I mean, there are untold uh, potential complications to, to anesthesia and, and surgical procedures. Uh, it, it, some of it also could be, and it depends, is it long-term incontinence? Could it be that he um, may have had a problem with his prostate before surgery, and surgery will aggravate a lot of conditions that we're just getting by? Right. And then we do something, and it makes that condition worse. Um, it, it may have, again, as he mentioned, something to do with the medicines. Um, I wouldn't necessarily directly relate that to the hip surgery, but I would certainly tell them they should get it checked out. Yes. Well, and I would look at the medicines that the patient's Correct. on now compared mm -hmm. to before. Certainly, uh, the narcotics that you use for yep. pain blows your ability to pass urine normally. It yep. obstructs things, yep. things can get infected. Well, surgery changes a patient's body. and. That's that's a fundamental aspect of surgery and how and they're different after they have the operation and how they respond to medicines and things may be different. Um, I got a question. But that's from, a rare. That certainly is a rare complication. And uh, that's not a common deal. Well, I you know I have to say that uh, that in my age my patient's age bracket, which is uh, very geriatric, uh, that uh, you blink at them twice and something can fail. Mm -hmm. You know it, you know so let alone. Uh, uh, cut open their hip and then and saw around on the bones and right. drive a spike through into the you know the whole nine yards. I, I wanted to make it sound pretty bad, <laughs> but the point I'm making is you, you do little things to these people and they, they change. And bladder is one of those things that'll that they can get into trouble. We have a question about using lasers mm -hmm. for low back pain. Now uh, I'm I'm going to ask you about lasers. There's a lot of laser surgery. Then lasers used as a knife, or it used it used to be used for a knife, or it's yeah. used in. I, I'm shaking my head. Have you ever used a laser very often? Only to like point on a screen, or things like that. Not we, an you know, we, <laughs> when we when we did the initial gallbladders, they always would say, "I want the laser gallbladder." And yeah. there were some um, laser technique that they used, and they and they found, as you saw on the video with the gallbladder, that cautery works just as well, far safer, and and far cheaper. And so um, a lot of folks would say, I want that laser gallbladder, but we know what it is. It's just the standard. So um, in our world, no, we don't use it as much. Now, I know that ophthalmology uses it on the back of the eyes to do certain things. Uh, I know that plastic surgery will do certain types of, types of laser, be, uh, certain radiation to do peels on the face for skin lifts and that sort of yeah. thing, but not so much in our world. Urology, uh, Urology does too. I mean, they use lasers. Inside the bladder. Mm -hmm. Inside the bladder and on the prostate. Correct. Laser, but I'm not necessarily certain that it's been shown to be any better than the old, old not, stuff. Not too. in our world. New does not necessarily mean better. That's true. Uh, we have a question. Uh, we have, that was it. That was a, uh, so uh, the other question that I would have is I had a patient who had had uh, knee surgery and following that surgery, uh, the patient uh, uh, became confused. And mm -hmm. we've got about 30 seconds left, uh, and was confused for three, four, five days. And I thought, a stroke? I mean, I did everything under the sun, and, uh, and he came out of it. And uh, it happened again the next time he had surgery. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the narcotics in that and guy. And the tolerance. Was, yeah. Some people are really sensitive, and others are not. Absolutely. So we have to go to this. Now for the answer of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz, the best treatment for an infection that is collected into a red, hot, swollen, painful, inflamed boil is antibiotics and cold compress, yes or no? No. No. A knife into the pocket of pus and hot compresses. Yes. Correct. Massage and crystal therapy? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> the answer is number two. Drain the wound, apply heat, antibiotics are less important. And again, Susan, Campbell from Rapid City correctly answered our question. Susan, thank you for calling. We'll send that to you. We'll be back right after this. <coughs> Sorry, flu. You're not you when you have the flu. Get vaccinated, because stopping the flu starts with you. 
About 150 years ago, one in four fighting in the Civil War died, amounting to some 620,000 deaths. Two-thirds were due to disease, not injury, and a full half of non-traumatic deaths were from diarrhea illness, unknowingly due to the contaminated water. The remaining non-traumatic deaths were from respiratory illness, particularly lethal because 90% of the soldiers were weakened by chronic diarrhea and malnutrition. That said, one-third of the deaths that came from injury would have been worse had it not been for the surgeons that became experienced during the Civil War. There had been radical improvements in weaponry at the time with new rapid-fire rifled muskets which caused cone-shaped bullets to spiral, giving an impressive accuracy at a 300 to 500 yard range. In the face of such deadly weapons, smart soldiers hid behind trees and rocks and earthworks, but too often had exposed legs or arms. It's no surprise limb injuries accounted for 70% of all wounds. These bullets tore enormous, easily infected wounds with shattered bones, pieces of clothing, and non-sterile skin pulled into those wounds. Most trauma surgery had to be performed within the first 24 hours after injury in open air field tents. The value of sterility was not yet realized and there was no understanding of clean instruments, clean wounds, or even clean hands. The world would have to wait 10 more years before Joseph Lister popularized sterile surgical technique and before the value of clean water was understood. One war reporter wrote, they would work for days without washing. As he waited for the next man to be placed on the table, the surgeon would stand back holding his knife in his boot or even in his teeth. Another description. The surgeons and their assistants stripped to the waist and bespattered with blood, cut and sawed away with frightful rapidity, throwing the mangled limbs on a pile nearby as soon as removed. Without sterile technique to repair a wound, amputation actually provided a better chance of survival. Although there was no sterility, anesthesia was available during the Civil War. Ether had been discovered in the 1840s, and by 1861, chloroform became popular by field surgeons because it was less flammable, less nauseating, and more portable. Records indicate that during the entire war, general anesthesia was given 80,000 times with only 43 recorded anesthesia deaths. The reported screams coming from surgical tents were not from anesthetized patients, but from wounded soldiers about to have surgery. Then, as the war ended, some 15,000 experienced surgeons returned to their home communities all over the United States. Who would have thought that from the horrors of war, life-saving knowledge of anesthesia and surgery would spread throughout this country? A heartfelt thank you to our special guests, Jeff Johnson and Gary Timmerman. You both brought great insight to our discussion tonight. Flu cases continue to climb as the season progresses. We're right in the time when historically flu cases really take off. If you haven't received your flu shot yet, don't delay. Get your flu vaccine now to reduce your chances of catching the flu bug. So from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. part of the country know that winter brings many special concerns to everyday life. Staying healthy is even more of a struggle during this time. Winter Health, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. 
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Avera Heart Hospital, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physician Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Swift Tel Communications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishbeck Financial Corporation. Thank you.